So with that, hopefully you've already found Job chapter 12, because we're actually going to cover a good handful of, of chapters today, Lord willing. It's not impossible that we get to the point where we've uh, are all studied out and need to save the rest for later, as we often do, but um, it is our hope to get through Job's entire response, which is three chapters long, but we'll see that unlike previous chapters, as we get further into the discourse, we find that uh, Job starts using larger and larger chunks to deal with uh, more singular issues, so that should help speed our response along. So we start at chapter 12, and we want to remind you that the book of Job is about uh, the, the Lord allowing Satan to test Job, to take things from Job, basically all that he has, his family, his health, and leave him in this place of absolute want with no idea why it happened. And why this uh, was allowed to happen was that Job had challenged God's choice to put all these little free humans out there to make their own choice, saying they're surely unworthy of being, bearing your image. They're surely unworthy of uh, being stewards of the earth. And so this is the test at which uh, God is challenged because Job is here as this shining example of faithfulness. And Satan says, well, he's only faithful because you're nice to him. He's only faithful because you give him everything he wants. If you started taking things from him, then he would become faithless. And so these conversations represent uh, Job and his friends working out as best they can in this context what's going on. So we are continuing on. Zophar's message was repent like Bildad's, but as we saw, his repent had a little bit more fire in it. He was a little bit more mean-spirited, a lot more arrogant, super self-righteous, and ultra-judgmental ultra because he had no idea what was going on. As is so often the case with arrogant, self-righteous, and judgmental people, he found that, or what we are going to find and what uh, Job is going to correct Zophar on, is that if you don't know who you're talking to, you should probably be silent. And if you don't know what you're talking about, you should probably be silent. And all your self-righteous judging is meaningless in terms of truly um, bringing about God's ends. And that's what Job's response is going to be. So we're going to look at three chapters, and we're going to give you the three big sections of the first two chapters, and then there's only two sections in the last chapter. But in Job 12, Job says, you guys are so arrogant, and you don't even know it. And then in Job 7, 12 through, or 12, 7 through 12, he talks about what we're going to call natural revelation. And finally, God's sovereignty in Job 12, 13 through 25. So if you want to like kind of etch around those and help, help you organize Job's argument, Job 13 turns around and kind of repeats this idea. Before they were arrogant, now they're foolish. And we're going to see dangerously foolish. And then in 13 through 13, 13, 13 through 19, or verses 13 through 19, he says, guys, I've got a plan. I'm not as foolish. I'm not as stupid as you're taking me for. And then uh, 20 through 28 is Job's prayer. And then finally, Job uh, kind of laments and moves on to more of an introspective thought. He's basically, again, if I'm just going to quickly overview these first 12 verses, it's life is tough. Job recognizes that it's just tough all over. And then, whereas before he was longing for death and begging for death, uh, and, and yet, uh, as we studied in that picture, not totally losing hope, now he's saying, I wonder what death's like, right? Because he's brought to this point. So, I'll say it again. We are going to be moving along quickly. And it does assume, so I'm very sorry for our guests, this is going to be a lot of catch up, but I'm confident that you'll be able to keep up. Um, so long as we keep our Bibles in front of us and you're kind of following along each section, you shouldn't get lost. But even still, it's going to be fast moving for all of us. So the first chapter again is, er you are arrogant, natural revelation, and God's sovereignty. So we start off with this, you are arrogant. I love the words to which Job replies. And we saw how uh, Zophar upped the ante, calling Job a fool and better. So Job says, no doubt you are the people, and wisdom will die with you. That's such a great statement, right? He's essentially saying, no doubt you're the only source of wisdom. You are the wisest, most intelligent, most wonderful person. And when you guys die, oh, this world is barely going to get by. 
Everybody needs you because you're so smart. He's really also obviously uh, inferring, wow, you half-blind, totally ignorant goofballs figured it out. It's amazing. I would never have thought of that. And the reason why he's, he's being so sarcastic is to point out what he's going to say is that I, I know this. Everybody knows what you're saying. You're, what you're saying isn't profound or interesting. It's just self-righteous and boring. So, here we get to this picture of arrogance. And I want you to remember Zophar's speech, especially, for an empty-headed man will be wise when a wild donkey's cult, cult is born to a man, in verse 12. He's, he's essentially calling Job or asking, like, Job, are you a hopeless idiot? It was a pretty thoughtless thing to do, particularly, again, to your friend who has just lost his family, his business, his friends, his health, and everything. To be that wildly uh, presumptuous to say, maybe you're also a, a, a fool, is, is pretty hurtful. But Job reminds them that this is not his first rodeo. He says, I am not, in, or says, sorry, but I have understanding as well as you. I am not inferior to you. Indeed, who does not know such things as these? Job is reminding them, this is stuff that we all know. This is stuff that everybody knows. And it shows us, again, as Job lived around the time of Abraham, that even though there was widespread darkness, there was a large amount of people who knew about Yahweh, who knew about the truth and the character of the God of the Bible. Even though Job is in no way we can tell related to Abraham or Abram or Abraham as he becomes later known, we find that Job and his friends are all knowledgeable about the character of God to greater and lesser degrees for sure, but Job is letting them know that this is something that he is basically informed about, and in fact that he expects everyone is basically informed about. If you want to put it a simple way, he's saying, you're boring. You're just repeating all your childhood Sunday school facts, and you're totally out of your depth and out of your context here. He's saying, Job knows what we all know, and in this life, he goes on to say that sometimes the bad guys win. He says, I'm mocked by my friends who called on God, and he answered him, the just and blameless who are, are, is ridiculed, a lamp is despised in the thought of the one who is at ease and is, ma uh, is made ready for those whose feet slip, the tent of robbers prosper, and those who provoke God are secure in what God provides by his hand. So he sees and struggles with what all believers of all ages see and struggle with, and that is that the wicked apparently prosper. Not certainly in every case, but in enough cases to be deeply disturbing to men and women of faith. We see powerful men and women of great wealth, of influence and authority doing everything they can to defy the righteousness, goodness, or holiness of God, and yet they remain unstruck by lightning, untroubled by sickness, and seem to live long and successful lives from the world's perspective. And Job is pointing this out because up until now, his friends are kind of playing the simpletons, right? They're constantly asserting, you are suffering, you must be in sin. They're playing basically a, a human version of religion. They've dumbed everything down and said, God's just and God's righteous, which is true. Therefore, he must implement that justice and that righteous immediately. And if you're suffering, it's because bad things have happened. So Job is pointing out that there's a larger reality how much they understand it is up to question, but he's pointing out again that, hey, in, this, in the context of this discussion, you guys have got yourself closed into an argument that just isn't true. However, I would point out, he's saying, that uh, the bad guys often win, and we've got to figure out how to square that to the God who we know is just and holy and righteous. Obviously, we know that this entire period from the fall all the way to the judgment is a time of grace, wherein God is forestalling His judgment and giving man an opportunity to be redeemed and reconciled to Him. But that still makes it difficult for us to watch as it happens. Moving on to the next section, Job talks about natural revelation. And this beautiful poetic section might cause us to ask, is Job, somehow a pagan or pantheist or animist or something else that seems to be saying, go worship nature or go learn from nature. But that's not at all Job's thrust. 
Quite to the contrary, we have to listen. It says, but now ask the beasts and they will teach you, and the birds of the air and they will tell you, or speak to the earth and it will teach you, and the fish of the sea will explain to you. Who among all these does not know that the hand of the Lord has done this? And in whose hand is the life of every living thing and the breath of all mankind? Does not the ear test words and the mouth taste its food as the mouth tastes food? Wisdom is with the aged men and with length of days, understanding. So this beautiful poem is talking about, or in this beautiful poem, Job is talking about revelation. How does God reveal himself? And there is, we could uh, expand upon different sections of this, but for simplicity's sake, there are three major ways that we call general revelation, and that is what Job is appealing to. Job is appealing to them to look at creation and say, this is the most basic knowledge or information about God that people can come to. And so Psalm, 19, or Psalm 19, rather, 1 through 6, and Romans 1, 18 through 20, both talk about how nature reveals certain aspects of the character of God right? When we look at nature, we can see that God has an amazing intelligence, ability, design, desire for aesthetic beauty. We can see how God's plan has order and structure. We can see how God created so many things of such variety. We can see that He is an infinite intelligence. We can see that He is of infinite strength or uh, power. We can see so much, and that is at the core of what they can see from nature. Now, providence shows us that God is good. That is to say that while we are in rebellion against God as a race, as a species, God continues to provide for us the earth to bring forth bread and food and animals that can make more animals, that can make more animals, that can feed us. God continues to provide for us while we are in rebellion against Him. That is a sign of God's goodness and love. You think about the absurdity of the evolutionary story and how at any given moment that all life could have been wiped out on a thousand different junctures and crosses and yet crossings, and yet they blindly, with blind faith, say, but it didn't, so it must be okay, or something to that effect. But what we truly see is that God is supernaturally keeping this world going, keeping it alive, keeping us alive in spite of our state of rebellion. And the final bit of general revelation that I think is being alluded to here is conscience. Uh, we got Romans 2, 14 through 15 as a proof text, but we can see throughout our own experience and throughout the entirety of the Bible that part of being made in God's image, flawed though we are, is that we all have an inbuilt sense of right and wrong. That can be scarred, that can be seared, that can be marred, and that can be perverted, but every single person on earth has some sense of right and wrong. It's really interesting, right, when you see uh, certain criminals and certain um, people who are wound up in, in prison for terrible, violent crimes, but then they'll talk about things that they would never do. Well, I'd never do that. That's stealing. You just killed five people. It's amazing, right? It's a scarred conscience, but it is a conscience that's reflecting something that had to be put into us from outside. And that is a sense of right and wrong. And while we aren't capable of uh, enforcing and understanding that or putting out that standard on our own, it shows us without any knowledge of special revelation that there is a God who's quite amazing that He has provided and continues to provide. There's a goodness to Him. And finally, that we're in a bad place with Him. As all the ancient cultures of the world sought various different forms of sacrifice and human sacrifice, they were responding to the inbuilt knowledge that God is somehow moral and we're somehow not making it. That is built into mankind. We can find that without any revelation. That's what Job is saying. He's saying, you're doing the play school stuff. Everybody knows this about God. You don't, even need you don't even need to know God to know this about Him. And so Job is challenging them. As we see, there's also special revelation. In our age, we look to special revelation. We look to the Scripture, the Word of God. And we look to Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who is the visible expression of the living God. So this is called special revelation. 
In Job's time, however, we're not sure what avenues of, uh, of, of relationship that Job had with God. We're not sure how much of the Scripture he would have had, whether or not he was receiving direct or angelic revelation. Uh, we, we just don't know. But we do know that Job knows God very well, as this task has proven thus far. Job is pointing out that anyone knows what they're saying and they really shouldn't pretend to be swimmers when they haven't ever left the shallow end of the pool, so to speak. So, we move on to our next section, which is God's sovereignty. So Job then goes on to another diatribe about God's sovereignty to affirm to them that he knows what they're talking about, probably better than they do, and that he agrees. You see, as Job has gone through this trial, he he's, has an intimate and true relationship with God, and that's caused him to ask some questions that his friends found troubling, threatening, even blasphemous, and they called him on it, and he's pointing out, look, you don't even understand how faithful he, I am to God, right? They could have had they been more attentive, but the reality of the matter is, is that they'd missed the moment when Job's wife, after all that they'd lost, said, curse God and die. And he said, no, I wouldn't do that, loosely paraphrased. So Job is now going to affirm to them exactly what they believe. But first we have to make a note on sovereignty. God is, as we see, beyond all question, sovereign over all things. So he moves on and says, with him are wisdom and strength. He has counsel and understanding. If he breaks a thing down, it cannot be rebuilt. If he imprisons a man, there can be no release. If he withholds the waters, they dry up. If he sends them out, they overwhelm the earth. With him are strength and prudence. The deceived and the deceiver are his. He leads counselors away plundered and makes fools of the judges. He loosens the bonds of kings and binds their waist with a belt. He leads princes away plundered and overthrows the mighty. He deprives the trusted ones of speech and takes away the discernment of the elders. He pours contempt on princes and disarms the mighty. He uncovers deep things out of darkness and brings the shadow of death to light. He makes nations great and destroys them. He enlarges nations and guides them. He takes away the understanding of the chiefs of the people of the earth and makes them wander in a pathless wilderness. They grope in the dark without light, and he makes them stagger like a drunken man. So, again, this picture of God being overall. Now, we do want to make sure that we understand the way the Bible uh, defines sovereignty, the way that we as humans define sovereignty, is not um, micromanaging or hyper-controlling. Sometimes people mispaint the idea of God's sovereignty as if the world was a computer program and God controls every single zero and one, down to every thought you think and down to every... It's all God's controlling, God's doing. It's absolutely, you know, a, a, a prefixed, fatalistic program. But that's not what sovereignty means in any circumstance. When we say that a nation is a sovereign nation, we mean that that nation is able to rule itself and make its judgments based upon uh, no other influence or no outside influence or authority but its own. So, as America is a sovereign nation, you might be, although less and less likely to be so, you might be, let's say, put to death for uh, committing the act of murder. And there's no other nation that could come in and say, no, you cannot put that person to death unless there be some sort of uh, violent conflict, right? <clears throat> that wouldn't happen. However, the sovereignty of the nation did not make or will the first person to murder the second. It only shows that it has the power and authority to execute its will upon that person. And so it is with God's sovereignty. It doesn't mean that He makes every decision happen. It means that whenever He chooses to make Himself involved in His story, there is no power that can oppose Him and no authority that can overrule Him. That's what God's sovereignty is about. And so he shows this use, these various uses of God's power in being able to overpower any human power, any even ability, should the need arise. So, with this picture in mind, he is trying to tell them, guys, look, I'm as orthodox as you. I don't question God's goodness, and I certainly don't question God's judge, uh, justice, and I certainly don't question God's sovereignty. I'm not questioning the core doctrines of who God is. I'm trying to figure out what's going on here. Trying to show a little compassion is essentially his request. 
Moving on to uh, the next chapter, 13, he says, you are foolish, which is not terribly nice, but it's true, so it's a loving thing to say. Man who is born of... Oh, wait, sorry, 13. Behold, my eye has seen all this. My ear has heard and understood it. What you know, I also know. I'm not inferior to you. I wanted to wait to talk about this until we got to the repetition of it. Twice in two chapters, he's starting both chapters saying, I am not inferior to you. I am not inferior to you. Oh my goodness, does that sound like, does that smack a little bit of arrogance to us perhaps? It might just, right? If you have someone going around saying, I'm as good as you, I'm as good as you, you assume that guy has some kind of an inferiority complex. But here's what we might miss in this conversation. Job was not a novice. Now, we don't know, except from what they say, how uh, deep these men's relationship with the Lord or relationships with the Lord were. But we do know that Job was on immensely intimate terms. Job was regularly making righteous sacrifices to God for he and his family and his business. He was a righteous and godly upright leader. I mean, consider just for a moment what it means that Job was picked by God as the example of what goodness and what a human could do and embody. That's a remarkable remarkable intimacy with God, we must assume. And here, these people, these men who, who are his friends, of course, are acting like they are his seniors, they are his teachers, they are his spiritual betters. And at this point of his brokenness, it's all Job can take. He has to remind them, at least in some term, that he knows the Lord far better than they do. And so, just like, um, and I imagine you've had this experience where you're somehow working in an area that you have expertise and experience, and someone comes along clearly knowing much less about it and says, have you tried to uh, do that one? Right? It's kind of the same uh, frustration that Peter probably felt when he was on the boat and Jesus came up from the shore and said, have you tried fishing on the, on the other side? The other side of the boat, you can imagine how annoyed Peter would have been at that, being a professional fisherman who'd got skunked all night. Well, it's kind of the same thing. Job was a, wasn't just a business authority or a family authority or a local leader. He was a spiritual authority. And it wasn't something that was, um, something that was uh, made up. It was real. He had an authentic relationship with God. To have these essentially spiritually immature young pups coming and lecturing him when he knows they're wrong, and we're about to see how intensely wrong they are, how dangerous what Zophar had just said was. They needed to be reminded, hey, remember who you're talking to here. The only reason they can take this arrogant posture with Job is that he is underneath the greatest testing that this, anyone on this earth had seen, at least to record. That's the only reason. Just because he's down, they can look down upon him. And he's reminding them that he's not as spiritually immature as he, see, he, he uh, might appear or they might be able to think because of his physical situation. Um, he's, he accuses them here of forging lies. I, I like that. It's a pretty direct thing to say. And they are. He says, but you are forgers of lies. You are all worthless physicians. Oh, that you would be silent and it would be your wisdom. I love that. Oh, that you would just be quiet and that would be the wisest thing you've said so far. And hopefully we learned in our previous lesson with Zophar that he should have just been silent. He would have done himself at least no harm. And as we're going to see, in misrepresenting God, he does something truly harmful or would be truly harmful if Job were not so spiritually mature in this. Be silent. Job's friends think they are defending God. They think they are. They're well-intentioned. They're trying. They're, they're trying to, to prove Job wrong in his questioning of what's going on around him. And what I believe very sincerely that Job wants them to understand is God doesn't need your defense, and He certainly doesn't need to be defended from me who loves Him and desires to know Him and just wants to know what's going on. 
you've got me all wrong, and therefore you're standing up for God as if God couldn't stand up for himself. Do we ever get there? Do you ever feel like you need to be the one who's going to make that one argument, make that one statement? You're going to defend God, and otherwise he's pacing the thrones of heaven, worrying that someone might disprove him, and you won't be there to reprove him so he can pop back into existence? It's ridiculous. It's absurd. God does not need a defense of human making. God has given us His defense. And exposing people to the Word of God is ultimately the most powerful thing that you can do. And so here they are trying to make up defenses for God rather than recognizing that if Job is being offensive to God, God is capable of taking care of Himself as certainly they should have seen. They're speaking for God, right? Remember what Zophar said last time? Look, Job, we all know you've sinned. You know you've sinned. Just confess, and then God will make everything great again. He'll give you back all your stuff, and you'll be healthy and powerful and rich, and everyone will love you again. Job, but what was the problem with that? It was an out-and-out, 100% absolute lie. There was no truth at all to what Zophar was saying in this context. If Job would have taken that advice, he would have made himself a liar and certainly done great damage to his own perception and understanding of God. So in other words, while these guys might be well-intentioned, particularly Zophar in this last instance, what he's given is fatally bad advice. He's essentially said, as is the common thing, I've got a word from the Lord for you. He told me you're sinful. But God didn't tell Zophar that Job was sinful because Job wasn't sinful. Job had not done anything that brought this upon him. And so we want to point out that anytime someone speaks with the authority of or claims that they have a word from the Lord for you, you better insist that they provide chapter and verse because this is how God speaks to us. This is a big issue in our world. Because if we say, I have a word from the Lord for you, and then say something that I think or I feel, then God is no longer God. My thoughts and my feelings are God. My intuition is God. This is what God's told you, and we can all look at it together. But if I tell you I have a word from the Lord for you, you better be asking for a receipt, or you're begging to be misled. Because as some, uh, actually it was some foolish young college boy once purportedly came up to a woman and said, a young lady, said, God told me that I'm supposed to marry you. And she said, if it was that important, don't you think he'd have told me too? Fortunately, she left that fool behind her. And you also need to leave that fool behind you. Ask for the receipts. Ask for the biblical proof. It's not saying we don't want to be teachable. That's far from the truth. But it is never okay to deify our thoughts, our feelings, our emotions, or our perceptions, or else we're going to be in the same boat as Zophar, who told Job an utter lie. Just get right with God. Just get right with God, and the blessings will rain down again, right? And he was wrong. He was decidedly wrong. And it is a dangerous thing to speak in the name of God. And so then we get to the next point, is that they are also lying from God, not for God. Now, I think we can all appreciate this as well, not that we appreciate it in the sense of liking it, but it's easy to get in over our head in a conversation with an unbeliever or someone who believes differently, and it can be quite easy to, in desire to win the or, uh, conversation, lie, start fast-talking, start equivocating. And we want to remember what Job is teaching his friends. That's that God doesn't need you to hustle people into a right relationship with Him. He is calling. He is drawing. He has opened the gate. He has sent His Son, in our case, right? He has made known. And God doesn't need a salesman or a hustler. He needs a messenger who brings the good news. And so it is in this as they try to lie and equivocate, they haven't really considered the heart of God or the desire of God. They haven't considered uh, the plan of God, and they don't know what's going on. So Job then comforts them after having pointed out the great danger of the position that they're putting themselves in. His sex, or he says here, I have a plan, more or less. So he says, why do I take my flesh and my teeth? 
and put my life in my hands. Though he slay me, yet I will trust, yet will I trust him. Even so, I will defend my own ways before him. He also shall be my salvation, for a hypocrite could not come before him. Listen carefully to my speech and to my declaration with your ears. See now, I have prepared my case. I know that I shall be vindicated. Who is he who will contend with me if I, now I hold my tongue and perish? Okay, so first off, we want to see how far must we go to have this attitude. Job is essentially saying, I submit to him in everything. I know he loves me enough. I know he loves me too much to let this go on interminably and not, not give me some kind of an explanation. How remarkable that is to come to that point with that level of humility and going, look, you guys are out of line. I know him. And you're wondering why I'm willing to take my, fle take my flesh and my teeth, put my life in my hands. In other words, willing to risk my life. It's because of his love for God, his desire to honor God and know God in all things. And essentially he's saying it would be better to be dead than to be wrong about the picture and image of the character of God, which he had. He's willing to take that risk because right now, as far as he understands it, he's done nothing wrong or deserving of this judgment, and God has uh, somehow punished him unjustly. And he says, that doesn't work. So I want to talk to God. I want to get this straightened out. And I'd rather die, uh, die and being corrected than continue to have to question what I know to be true of God. Now, interestingly, as we get into this wonderful verse, he says, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. He's saying, if God chooses to kill me, honestly, how much have I lost? Already having lost his family, his friends, his health, he's really not got a whole bunch left to lose in terms of on the earthly plane. So if, if asking the question gets him slain with God, then mercy, let it, bring it on, he's saying. Because even if he slays me, I know eventually I'm going to find out that he is just and righteous, loving and merciful. I just need to figure out how, and I'm willing to die to find out. Even so, I love this, I will defend my own ways before him. Now that sounds a, a bit uh, arrogant or even worrisome, right? I'm going to defend my ways before God. But here's the thing, Job had such an intimate relationship with God that he's saying, I'm willing to be wrong, but please correct me. So I'm going to continue to say what I understand and what I know is right, knowing that God is big enough to correct me, knowing that He can take it, knowing that He's not threatened or worried or insecure by a single thing that I might ask or say. And I know He loves me, and I love Him, and I am going to push this through because it would be untrue of me to do something like lie to myself and say, oh yes, I know what sin this was, I know, I really, I understand. It would be untrue, it would be ungodlike in character of Job to lie to himself or to buckle to peer pressure when he knows that's not true, or at least what he knows leads him to believe that's not true. And of course, in this case, we know that he's right. In other words, he's saying, I was God's property from the beginning. If he wants to slay me, I still trust him, but I'm not going to pretend like we're not in a relationship, because we are. And then it says this interesting thing, and some of us will have different translations here. It says, he also shall be my salvation, for a hypocrite could not come before him. Now, the Hebrew word he, uh, or the word he actually just translates the masculine pronoun, which you would expect when he is the answer. However, in this case, it could be he or most of your modern translations, like your ESV, your Net Bible, NASB 2020, I think your NIV, is going to have it right? So there's a difference. So what are the two translations doing? And then we can talk about which one's more uh, likely. He here is uh, actually pointing forward. Now, this is interesting because you would generally use a, a pronoun going back, referring to something back. So you have to jump quite a ways back to get to him and use he in this context. It's not unreasonable, but fascinatingly, this wonderful Hebrew word is the word used here for salvation, as it always is, the word Yeshua. So this is the reason why your King James and New King James translators are more likely to choose he. 
because they want to see this. Is anybody familiar with that word, Yeshua? Yeah, of course. That's the Hebrew name that Jesus was called by, right? That's the Hebrew name. Yeshua is the name that the angel gave to name Jesus. So if you would have gone down to Israel in the time of Christ and yelled, Jesus, 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 he would not have turned around. Well, he's God, so he would have. But, you know, under ordinary circumstances, everyone else would say, why are you calling him Jesus? His name was Yeshua. It's a fascinating thing, and, you know, I don't mean to sound mystical. It's not mystical at all. God named Jesus salvation, the Hebrew word for salvation, because Jesus is our salvation, or Jehovah saves you, whatever it is, however you want to put it out. So it's not like this is some sort of mystical, magical accident. This was God's plan from the beginning. It's another one of the ways that God points us to the salvation in Jesus Christ. And again, many translators like to see the, uh, like to point out possible references to Christ in the Old Testament. There are plenty, and they are glorious. Um, but this, it is in question, is whether it is one. So it could be that he's saying, and this will be my Yeshua, this will be my salvation. He, rather, will be my salvation, looking to God's mercy and justice to, to vindicate him. However, as likely as not, again, the most of the modern translations take this to be it, meaning his defense will be his salvation. And in that case, which in this case I think is the more likely, what he's saying is that by honestly representing himself before God and getting God's honest correction, he will be vindicated. He'll be saved from the awful perceptions and misconceptions of God that are, being, that are kind of threatening and haunting his thoughts. Listen carefully to my speech. Oh, for a hypocrite could not come before him, right? In this sense, he's saying, I am not two-faced. I'm not lying. I'm not deceiving. I'm not putting on a show to impress you guys after I've lost everything. I am completely simple, is what kind of the concept means. I'm completely one-dimensional. I am just what you see is what you get. I am willing to come before God in good conscience, ready to be corrected. So he says, listen carefully to my speech and to my declaration with your ears. See now, I have prepared my case. I know that I shall be vindicated who will contend with me if I now hold my tongue, I perish. Now again, it's a tough thing to take a position before God and try to argue your own case. But I believe that what he's doing, while God is going to humble him severely at the end of the book, is exactly what God wants after a fashion. He wants people who will exist in relationship with Him. He wants people that in times of difficulty will cry out even in frustration and anger. If there's any wonder of that, listen to the, uh, the Psalms as David cries out, Why have you not heard me, O Lord? Listen unto my cry. He's not just quietly and humbly sitting back on a couch and right. He's crying those words out with tears because he knows that God can take it and God longs to be in that relationship that is authentic and that you can even ask questions and even be frustrated with. Now, rest assured, God's always right, but he's big enough that he wants us to be honest with him and not stuff down what we're really thinking and feeling in order to present the pretty face, the Sunday school face. It's the most tragic thing in the world that we would think we needed to hide our complaints and our fears and our curiosities and our theological doubts from God as if He was t threatened by them in any way. Speak them out. If you're questioning God's goodness, bring that to God. He will answer by one means or another. I want us to take another point of humility as we notice the, uh, there's some fire, obviously, in Job's words, but how would you do? How many of us would abandon our faith? Maybe just for a time. How many of us have, right, in a time of difficulty? God isn't giving me what I want. Fine. I'm done with God. No more Bible reading, no more praying, no more church. I go my way right? I have seen people uh, walk away, and we, we all have, right? We've known people who've walked away from God because of, the, of an unanswered prayer request for something very petty or something very great. They lost a loved one. They prayed for that person to be healed, and they weren't healed, and that caused them to walk away from God forever. I didn't get my way, therefore, or, or for some time. Job's wife, understandably, under similar pressure, told him to just go curse God and die, Let's just get on with this. But Job, on the other hand, again, having lost everything, 
says, I don't, I don't understand my situation, but my relationship with God is worth fighting for. It's not okay to Job to just say, all right, I guess God hates me now. I'll go die because he's known God. And it's worth, and he says, even if it kills me, I will not surrender my view that God is good and just and loving and cares for me. I'm not going to surrender that viewpoint. I'm not just going to give up and buckle under because I believe too much and would rather live with the God that he's known than die having believed a lie or thinking that it was a lie. And then we get Job's prayer. And Job's prayer has two simple requests, he says. First, Look up for a moment. He says, withdraw. Oh, sorry, we'll go back. Only two things do not do to me, then I will not hide myself from you. Withdraw your hand far from me, and let not the dread of you make me afraid. Then call, and I will answer. Or let me speak, then you respond to me. So, these are his two simple requests. Lord, just let up on the the suffering for a moment. I've lost my family, I've lost my job, and I'm sitting here breaking open boils with uh, broken pot shirts. Can we just cool it on the boils for a few minutes so I can get my thoughts together? And two, Lord, please break your silence. How long must those days have been? Undoubtedly, as his friends kind of arrogantly suggest, well, you're, you've got, there's hidden sin, there's sin, there's sin somewhere, you've sinned somewhere. And while he's listening to that, he's going, you don't think I've spent every waking moment, which is every moment because I can't sleep for terror at night, I haven't spent every moment examining every breath, every thought, every action, everything that I could have... You don't think I've been thinking about this? You guys are idiots. So he's saying, Lord, please just give me a moment and then break your silence. You can talk first or I'll talk first. I don't care, but let me know what's going on. It's all I ask. And then he goes on again saying, how many are my iniquities and sins? Make me know my transgression and sin. Tell me, Lord, tell me what this terrible or these terrible sins or the attitude, just let me know. Why do you hide your face and regard me as your enemy? Will you frighten a leaf? driven to and fro, and we pursue dry stubble, for you write bitter things against me, and make me inherit the iniquities of my youth. You put my feet in the stocks and watch closely all my paths. You set a limit for the soles of my feet. Just, Lord, break the silence. The final uh, section here of Job's retort gets introspective. First of all, life is tough. Man who is born of a woman is a few days and full of trouble. He comes forth like a flower and fades away. He flees like a shadow and does not continue. And do you open your eyes on such a one and bring me to judgment with yourself? Who can bring a clean thing out of an unclean? No one. Since his days are determined, the number of his months with you, you have appointed his limits so that he cannot pass. Look away from him that he may rest. Take till a hired man finishes his day. Even the easiest uh, easiest life on this earth, as we would perceive it, has great difficulties and challenges. We uh, We can all recognize and understand that while a person might have grown up in the wealthiest home, having every advantage, may not ever have known the true love of their parents might have just been pawned off and ignored. And you say, well, that's, that's really not much compared to the Oliver Twist situation where they've got no parents at all and they move from one abusive situation to the other. Yeah, that's true. But both lives are filled with difficulty and you cannot experience someone else's. So the rich boy's dilemma is no greater to him than is Oliver Twist's to him. Everybody's life is filled with challenge, is filled with difficulty, and no life is out without loss or pain. Every life is filled with suffering, and every life ends with death. It's quite interesting because both of these, uh, or both of the two great men asked this question in Scripture. The first was, or the, actually the second, the first was Job. The second was the book of Ecclesiastes written by Solomon, right? Job's question is brought about by pain, but Solomon asked the same question wrought from pleasure. He had the same difficulty. Isn't it just uh, vanity, vanity, a chasing after the wind? I tried work. I tried pleasure. I tried all these things, and none of them satisfied. And he comes to that same ultimate conclusion. 
to vastly oversimplify the book of Ecclesiastes, that the only meaningful life we can have is a life in right relationship with God. And Job really comes and has already come to that same conclusion through his suffering. Either way, whether through pleasure or a you know, good easy time or very great suffering, the point is the same, that growing relationship with God is the answer in both cases. Finally, he gets a little philosophical and asks, what is death like? He says, oh, that you would hide me in the grave, that you would conceal me until their wrath is past, that you would appoint me a set time and remember me. If a man dies, shall he live again? All the days of my hard service, I will wait till my change comes. You shall call, and I will uh, answer you. You shall desire the work of your hands. For now you number my steps, but do not watch over my sin. My transgression is sealed up in a bag, and you cover my iniquity. But as a mountain falls and crumbles away, and as a rock moves, moves from its place, as water wears away stones, as torrents wash away the soil of the earth, so you destroy the hope of man. You prevail forever against him as he passes on. You change his countenance and send him away. His sons come to honor, and he does not know it. They are brought low, and he does not perceive it. But his flesh will be in pain over it, and his soul will mourn over it. It's funny, my son and uh, my son, and my children actually, all except for Cadence, like video games. And video games now are super funny because you win them. You can, you can come to the end and you say, I beat that game. See, that's not the way video games were when I was growing up. Video games started off difficult and then they just got harder and faster and harder and faster until you die, just like life. And that's the reality, guys. I'm not here to sell you anything. Have you ever played Pac-Man? Like, you don't win Pac-Man. You remember come to the end, and they're like, hey, Pac-Man comes out, and all the ghosts are dead. Never happens. You just keep making, getting harder. Anyway, so the, the, the reality of it is, gang, that we face the ultimate reality that life is going to get harder and faster until we die. So Job is questioning that. We know that that happens because of sin. But I, I think it's important, and it's why it's so important that we look at these books, these wisdom books, even though they don't make for the most sunshiny reading, to recognize that ultimately this life is going to leave you with nothing but Jesus. And you'll have to answer at that time if He's enough. You're going to get there if you're a believer in Jesus today, most likely. And it'll be so much easier then if you've answered now with every day of your life. Apart from God's word, we would be crazy not to fear death. But because of God's word, we would be crazy to fear death. We just want to take a moment and, and remind ourselves how blessed we are. Job here, being the first book written, had very limited, we would think, information about God. Possibly, in some senses, more, more direct revelation, more opportunities, perhaps, I don't know. But we for sure have the great blessing of the wholeness of Scripture. We here in the church today, if you have trusted in Jesus Christ, your Savior, then the very nature and face of death changes from sort of, some sort of frightening unknown mystery to a time of greatest hope and anticipation. You see, when a believer in Jesus Christ dies, we find that they are absent from the body and present with the Lord. The moment when you stop breathing and you stop drawing breath and your heart stops beating, that moment you will know what it is to be in the presence of the Lord in a way that you've never known before. And so you will forever be with the Lord never apart from the lover of your soul. For a Christian to die, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. The word Paul uses in Philippians 1.21 has the sense of profit. Now, none of us is meant to uh, wish for death, hope for death, long for death. As we are here, we have an opportunity to glorify the Lord. We have an opportunity to spread His gospel. We have an opportunity to share His love, to, to glorify Him here. And that is a wonderful thing, regardless of the amount of pain, discomfort it might cause us. It's well worth it. But death is never to be feared, only to be looked upon as payday. Not payment for what we've done, but payment for what He's done and again eternally. 
We find that we are united with Him in His resurrection, and therefore we are safe from the second death. As having taken part of that first resurrection by faith in Him, there is nothing to fear in death for you as a believer. And that means that you can live in ultimate courage, knowing that whatever it is that takes you home, it will not have been apart from the sovereign knowledge and permission of God, knowing that whatever it is that takes you home, whatever uh, evil thing or person or demon it is that causes or inflicts your death will only be opening up the gates of glory for you to step in the presence of your Messiah forever. No one who can oppose you can ever truly be victorious because the worst thing that they can do to you is the best thing that can ever happen to you. That's a courage that we're meant to have as believers. So, just some short applications, uh, if we could, from this rather lengthy study. And again, thank you for sticking with me so we could uh, look at all these three chapters and come back with a fresh new argument in Eliphaz. Um, Silence is so often the best choice. You win on silence nearly every time. Think about it. Come back later when you've got something reasonable to say. Had, um, had, who are we on? Zophar. Had Zophar chosen silence, he would have spared himself a lot of trouble, as we'll see. Next. God has revealed Himself to us through the world around us, and just as Jesus used the physical world He created to give illustrations of the nature, character, and plan of God so we can be uh, benefited by the natural world, but ultimately the clearest and final uh, revelation of Himself is in the Word of God as it reveals the Son of God to us through the working of the Spirit of God within us. You have seen God and know Him through His wonderful Word. We have advantages that Job would never have dreamed of. God is sovereign. Again, we point out that this doesn't mean that God causes everything to happen. Far from it. There are many forces in this world, some, uh, you know, good and evil, and us who are kind of a mixed bag often. But God is not going to let anything happen against His will. While the political world seems to fly hopelessly out of control, the international situation seems to be uh, perilous at best and out and out wicked, if we're honest, God has never stopped being sovereign. This plan has never slipped away from God. Nothing ever got out of hand for God. He has exactly the right time and knows exactly the right moment when to step into this situation and change things forever. And you can trust in that, even if his timing doesn't match with what ours would be. God wants a relationship with you. He doesn't want you to lie and come to church and put on a smiley face. He doesn't want you to pray holy, pious-sounding prayers that impress others. He wants you to be honest with Him as Job longed to be honest with Him, willing to be wrong, willing to be proven wrong, desiring to be uh, made wrong as long as you got to see God more. He got to see God more clearly. And finally, death is nothing to fear. I'm not suggesting we become foolhardy. I'm only suggesting we take a sober view of this life. It will be over in a snap, and we will be into eternity, that which we will enjoy forever. So how should we then live? For this instant or for the eternity that will follow it? Let's close with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for uh, patience and attentive minds. Thank you for the example of Job, surely not perfect, as your correction will prove, but more faithful a man, more honest, more desirous to know you. Might we follow that great example? Might we listen to the loving call of your Son, Jesus Christ? Might we grow in the grace and knowledge of Him? And might we in all things and in all ways and in all times bring you glory through His name. In the matchless name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen.